Welcome to YouTube's favorite comic book channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Going to be taking a look at Wizard Magazine number 54 today. Jump onto our Patreon at the link in the description below this video. Become a King Kayfaber and mitigate the Kayfabe effect. You'll get all the videos before anybody else. And uh, you could have the opportunity to sit in with us while we live stream record this got a couple dozen people in the chat room right now at this early date and they're just going to keep uh, filling in uh they're getting all of the comics before anybody else the vids are brought to you by the books that we make also 2023 it's going to be a big year hip-hop family tree omnibus is coming to you this holiday season 504 pages with 140 pages of material that is not in those first four volumes including a bunch of art that i drew exclusively for this omnibus Red Room Crypto Killers 1, 2, 3, and 4 are coming out to you on a monthly basis beginning in May. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game. Each comic completely self-contained. So if you see an issue of Red Room, scoop it up, give it a shot. If you dig it, grab another. Two trade paperbacks of Red Room are out there. Three volumes of X-Men Grand Design and WYSIWYG. Jimmy has Street Angel Princess of Poverty forthcoming to you in a couple of months, man. July is it, Jim? Yes. Coming out in July, it's going to be collecting the material that is not in Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive, which has a new print edition. You get both volumes of Street Angel. You're going to have all of the Street Angel comics that Jimmy has created to date. He is the man behind the art of the Plain Jane's shoujo manga and the creator of Hulk Grand Design. Scoop up our books. Keep these videos coming to you on a regular basis. Without further ado, let's take a look at Wizard number 54 with this stellar cover, James. So I am way out at this point, like a <laughs> uh, freshman at college, you know, turning 19 in February 96 and just not, this is not my focus anymore. But I make fun of this Marvel DC crossover as being like, clearly they're just hot shotting. It worked. This is the number one book on Comicron you know, the numbers they post, this is the number one book for 95 and 96. So whatever they were hoping to achieve, they did it. They certainly sold these in massive numbers. Yes. We'll be getting into that. And Bart Sears here back on the cover, a uh, frequent wizard cover artist in the uh, early days of wizard magazine. Hadn't seen him for a while. And uh, here he is again. Look at him. Chunky muscles. <laughs> he uh, definitely drew everybody like they had been skinned. <laughs> and we got a big, uh, Wildstorm crossover. It's like a 20 plus some issue crossover. Fire from Heaven. I recognize some of the artists. I see Travis, as I called him, Cherist, uh, back in those days. I, I don't know how you say his name correctly. I see a little J. Scott Campbell. I feel like I see a little Jim Lee in there. And so much of the other stuff like this. I don't even know who drew that thing. Yeah, I didn't even realize this was a mashup of different artists because some of this stuff is super generic. Yeah. Um, Knowing that it is different artists, it would be kind of fun to break down, like, uh, try to guess these artists, because now that you say it, I, I do see a few people in there. I'll add Brett Booth is somebody I see, and I think uh, S. Clark, or, or Clark... Uh, Scott Clark. S Scott Clark, yes. I believe I'd give him Warblade on this uh, on this spread, <laughs> but I could be wrong. This is an issue that is uh, absolutely uh, burnt into my consciousness man I, I i read and reread this one a whole bunch of times the last two issues uh were dead spots to me but uh now i'm back on on board for another year or two uh from dust till dawn movie trail uh movie ad right here in the uh the anti-gravity room show like the only trevor von eden interview that they got on there man was because he, he drew the comic adaptation yeah i was gonna say that this is that era well, that's a strange ad for it for that movie yeah yeah, for sure. I, you know what it is, man. It's uh, hindsight twenty twenty. Uh, George Clooney ain't nobody yet. Like, right. like this is the movie that made him a movie star or just viable. Completely took off that ER varnish and get him to say a couple fuck words and realize, oh, this guy could do some stuff. Batman Contagion is uh, a uh, crossover that I remember from the newsstand. Still, there's still new spinner racks in the grocery stores and. Uh, Kelly Jones is is the Batman artist. I, I think those are the issues of uh, Contagion that I have. And maybe it's just this Batman 529. 
uh, if I remember correctly, like there's some sort of pathogen, some sort of pandemic. I was going to say, they should have uh, reissued this yeah. in the last couple of years, man. <laughs> totally. And uh, if I remember correctly, like the bridge in and out of Gotham that just kind of gets destroyed. So now like they're, the Gotham is an island unto itself and they got to gotta fend for themselves. We did an early uh, classic X-Men issue showing off the original issue of the comic uh, as well as the classic X-Men version, which they would they would add. Yeah. They would do the Hollywood version in classic X-Men to kind of try to take care of any weird retcon kind of things or, or build future continuity into those old series. And that's what this letter here is talking about, man, is like there's an appearance of apocalypse in the issue of uh, 119 of, of X-Men. Like, how is that possible? How come you don't say that that's his first appearance and they're just letting you know that they go back in and fiddle with things a little bit. It surprises me that wasn't pushed harder. Right. You know, like, like try to sell those reprints to everybody by saying like, even if you've got, if you've read them already, there's some extra uh, Easter eggs in these new, new reprints. No other real uh, letters to speak of uh, for me. Billy Tucci writes in. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah this is good. <laughs> we were talking about it before, man, on the cover of <laughs> She Won, Six Fingers on, on She. And he's attributing it to Jimmy Palmiotti, the anchor. Yes, he is. Throwing Jimmy under the bus. <laughs> and and Jimmy responds, I added an extra finger. Are you kidding? When I got the cover, there were nine fingers, a passport, and a hamburger. I did Tucci a favor. They That's went funny. back and, and redrew it. The mere fact that it's called out and recognized, I feel like that lends credence to my argument of it being kayfabe. I'll tell you, anytime this stuff comes up like this, I assume that that's the situation. Like, it's impossible not to be cynical now about anything that is a, some kind of a, you know, something wrong that gets attention called to it. You have to think that's a good stunt. There are literally ads on Instagram and stuff for, for games, and they intentionally make the character do the wrong thing, and it just gets engagement. <laughs> right. It pushes it so high on the algorithm, totally manipulating people who don't realize they're being spun. <laughs> I would love a zine of all the nine finger comic book drawings <laughs> or, or six fingers rather. Someone sent us a copy of uh, Captain Canuck. Uh, like I, I, I won that one in, uh, in our, our flip throughs. Like I, I realized like, uh, you know, first appeared in self-titled comic 1975 and it's like, Oh fuck, we got that. Uh, I thought it might've been even an older comic. Like I thought my Captain Canuck one was like some reissue of some older comic, but now nah, we definitely have that. And, should probably take a look at it under the microscope one time. Got your fan art. Uh, nobody of note who I recognize is going on to uh, bigger and better. It's true, but but an interesting selection of characters once again with Scud. Um, I'm a fan of, but feels like this is representative of a declining readership. You know, where like some of these other characters, I don't want to say secondary, but indie, you know, uh, Johnny Homicidal Maniac, Sandman's huge. So that one isn't uh, really too outlandish, even though it's not a superhero per se. It's a first Johnny appearance, which which is definitely noteworthy. Yonan Vasquez goes on to, to bigger and better, uh, to be sure. Scud was a darling. You know, Rob Schrab, he's, he was, he's a pimp. Like, he, Rob Schrab is a pimp, man. People who were at that first SPX tell stories of him wallpapering the bathrooms and the walls with stickers of scud like you couldn't look anywhere and not not see scud so that guy was putting himself out there in a big way and this comic was promoted all over the place yeah a shepherd is coming some more of that rob liefeld extreme destroyer stuff he gave them a lot of ad money you know you know i was thinking about this stuff like like uh the extreme studios books you recently read that Kitchen Confidential uh, Anthony Bourdain book. And there's that part in there where he talks about like new restaurateurs who have a declining, a business that's not making profit right away. And then the restaurateurs will hedge and start to have like two for one coupons and your penny saver and stuff like that to try to like bring people in. Rob was changing his comics a whole bunch. And like, if, if it wasn't hitting a certain number, he would try to like re-engineer it and then bring something out. And it's the same deal, in my opinion, man. It's kind of like a lack of confidence in the thing, not giving it room to grow and trying to go for that bombast or, or trying to like retool it to hit something bigger. And that's what we're seeing with some of these, you know, he talked about in the interview, new force is just new men. But now there's like, there was a new men comic, but we're going to break off. There's going to be new man and a new force. Right. 
Yeah, that's funny. It's very similar to that vibe. Do you think he was kayfabe when he had said there were 75 people on his payroll in that last issue of Wizard? Maybe. That's a big, big operation. 75 employees is a lot. Yeah. Police raid comic shops in Oklahoma and Florida. You did a little interview, man, with uh, Hart D. Fisher. He brought up that uh, Taste of Cherry book uh, in, in from Verotic number four, I believe, which mm-hmm. uh, has, has a teenage girl raped, tortured, killed while being snuffed, snuff filmed. Uh, this this got sucked up by the Vice Squad in Oklahoma. Florida's already on record, man, for for being a bunch of sensorial fuckheads, man, when it came to the Mike Diana. Yeah, I was going to say, this is just post-Mike Diana, I think a year later. Situation, man. So uh, mm-hmm. we're, 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 we're labeling Frank Thorne and, and Fantagraphics as child pornographers uh, because of characters in, in these uh, Eros books and things. Uh, Mike Lady Diana. Death getting lumped in with that Florida siege. Lady, or I mean, not Lady Death, just Death. Just Death, yeah. Uh, preposterous to think about Death as being like somehow put into this obscene pile there are these misguided do-gooders out there actually like in context i'm watching so much 90s stuff right now man for for the next comic that i'm working on and uh there was like an episode of 90210 that that talked about like like uh making condoms available to the students of beverly high and kids who went to beverly high in real life made that an issue in their school system and then if you remember like during the clinton administration I forget who the Surgeon General was, but she was promoting masturbation and and have condom availability. The AIDS epidemic is still going down at that point. Like, in what universe is lack of information uh, a good thing, especially when you have some stuff like that? So all of that was in the news. And I feel like the AIDS awareness component of this death thing was getting caught up in that conversation about premarital sex condoms yada yada for kids it's a comic book kids reads comics like like this is a very noteworthy piece of news uh at at this time pretty alarming to think about because uh, gen 13 number five gets right. added to that pile like unbelievable we have friends man uh bill boy show proprietor of copacetic comics here in town uh the vice squad came to his shop undercover capacity man and then you know they they let themselves be known And if your job, you know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Uh, These guys have perverted minds. Their minds are twisted, these vice cops. They have to look for disgusting things in everything. It's their job. And their job security is contingent on finding stuff that they can use to keep their job security. So uh, it can get as silly as trying to censor a fucking death comic. (laughs) Amazing. Let's just take all comics out of Florida. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you guys could go do do your thing. No comics for you. It's funny to see, like, uh, Hart D. Fisher and Gary Groth lumped together in an article. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the only other time you would see that, there was a uh, there's a documentary on the uh, rock and roll comics guy who met a tragic ending and, and stuff like that. And, and Groth is on there, and he, he misses no words. Yeah, those comics are fucking shit. Like, like who, <laughs> I'm sorry the guy's dead, but Jesus Christ, those comics are trash. Gotta love his honesty. Worlds collide. Marvel and DC merge. Their universe is into one. This is a call out to Amalgam. I swear to God, I thought we covered this uh, many issues ago, but it's just happening <clears throat> right now. Got a hot shot. The Marvel and DC stuff. Comics is doing so bad that Marvel and DC put together a little paper company together to put out these comics. Uh, they said that you know six books are uh, going to be published under the DC brand. Six books going to be published under the Marvel brand where you take two big characters like Batman and Wolverine, put them together and you get a blue and yellow Faust. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we have looked at that one. We have, and, and we should look at the rest. Uh, they're, they're, they're noteworthy comics. My question to you, Jimmy, is how do you, as publisher, you're a publisher of DC, I'm a publisher of Marvel, I want Legends of the Dark Claw. Like, like, how, like, how do we divvy these things up? Because I'll tell you what I don't want: Doctor Strange Fate. <laughs> you know what? Ironically, Doctor Strange Fate may be the best looking of all these books. Yeah, who does that one? It's I don't uh, have that one. Kevin Nolan on top of Jose Luis uh, Garcia Lopez. Oh, that sounds amazing. They're a great team because they do a Batman thing later on too, like a two issue one of those Batman. Uh, it's not Legends of the Dark Knight, but it's that type of book. 
and uh, it's it, they are a nice team together. Let's call some of these out, man. Uh, uh, we we looked at the Legends of the Dark Claw. That was uh, Jim Ballant, I believe. Jim Ballant, and then they do the the animated style. Yeah, the version. Ty Templeton type joint. That comes later. That's like that's way later. Uh, Super Soldier. I think that's Dave Gibbons. It is Dave Gibbons, and I think there are two issues of that overall. I don't like, know. Like with Dave Gibbons on both issues, Mark Wade may be writing. I don't know Amazon. I think there's one of these Amazons, I think might be a John Byrne. Okay. Is that true? Because he's doing Wonder Woman around this time, and I think it's a Storm Wonder Woman mashup, I think. Assassins, I think, is uh, Scott McDaniel. That sounds right. One of these ones, it might be either X, JLX or X Patrol. One of them is Jeff Matsuda. He actually okay. might be Ma- Magneto and the Med- Magnetic Man, actually. Uh, Spider Boy is a cool... Spider Boy is a cool costume. Like I feel like... The publisher of Legend of the Dark Claw doesn't get to get Spider Boy. You know, you gotta you gotta spread it out. Uh the Bruce Wayne Agent of Shield. Uh I think that might be Stuart Eminent. Uh Bullets and Bracelets, I think that's Gary Frank. Okay. Has that one. Like those are like the, the couple that I have. I have Speed Demon also. Uh but I forget who does that. Maybe Humberto Ramos or somebody. Uh and this is all these are twelve one shots. During the month that these books come out, n- no other superhero comics are coming out from from either company. Uh, and it looks like these are connected. It says the 12 one-shots lead into DC versus Marvel 4. So it looks like these are somehow connected to that, that crossover. And you wonder if these are thrown together whenever they start to see numbers and interest on DC versus Marvel. And they're like, hey, let's, let's it hot shot the hot shot. Yeah. Because these are one shots, so you could put them together relatively quickly. Yeah. You know, it's not a whole series that you've got a creative team like like working for four months. Like this is theoretically, you could get all of these produced in a month or so, and you could insert them into the middle of this hottest, hottest thing they're doing in comics at the moment. Right. Batman crossover leads into D- Detective 27. That's that contagion. Uh, storyline and and that's what we're getting here so many so many of these crossovers well, i was gonna say that the second story is your wild storm crossover now it's a batman crossover sin city begins six issue arc man uh that yellow bastard is going to start to get uh doled out that that was probably uh i i got on board with with silent night um i bought the books of the previous three up to uh big fat kill and then uh, Yellow Bastard is the first issues that I really started to get. I finally discovered comic shops Yeah. Uh, around this point. Finally figured out how pull lists work and little subscription forms and things. The buzz box is interesting, man. Jim Lee drawing Fantastic Four, question mark. Rob Liefeld drawing Iron Man, question mark. It might happen. Buzz hears that Marvel might license the comic book titles to individual Image Comic Studios... For, for Image to produce, specifically Wildstorm and Extreme, but check this out, man. Topps Comics is also reported to be in the mix. That's that's interesting. That And that did not happen as part of the uh, Heroes Reborn initiative. Just last month's issue of Wizard Magazine, uh, they did a whole piece, man, about these creative teams, including Bob Harris, who was the writer of Avengers, and all the stuff that they were going to do over the next year with these characters. Uh... It's this issue now that we see Bob Harris takes over uh, Marvel, becomes editor-in-chief. They get Tom DeFalco out of there. He's going to watch over Marvel in in total. And then with the very next issue of Wizard, we're going to have a Jim Lee illustrated Fantastic Four image on the cover. This is a crazy point in time for for Marvel because he may be, Bob Harris might be the editor-in-chief, but they create these little fiefdom uh areas i mean they already had that with spider-man x-men but there's gonna be like bobby chase with the marvel edge Mm -hmm. and like two or three other joints yeah and you know you could not write this better having these two on facing pages the announcement of the heroes reborn and, and bob harris taken over like you almost picture harris getting the call from whoever hey, you're being promoted editor-in-chief, and him hanging up and being like, hey, Rob, Jim, I got a job. You guys interested? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. like Dance with the one that brung you, right? (laughs) Totally, man. And you see guys like Scott Lobdo who who are getting paid, thanks to Bob Harris, just totally, like, sucking up to that. Oh, it's long overdue. Yeah. 
Starchild gets a call out, probably on the strength of being featured in a Palmer's pick previously, because otherwise I don't know how much that would be on the radar of Wizard Magazine. And uh, once it happens, you know, like these guys are smart enough, some of them, that you send your press releases to Wizard. Yeah, yeah. So so weird, because like I don't think very many of those Star Child comics came out. They're promoting an issue 12. I have a bunch of issues on the strength of Palmer's picks, by the way. But he's talking about planning it to 100, 100 issues. He's pretty ambitious. I think he kind of gets out of the comics part of the game and gets into other stuff. But like he takes over some longtime sci-fi magazine that I think he buys and continues to publish possibly to this day, but definitely for a long time. So interesting guy behind the scenes in terms of uh, creating, but maybe not just comics. Great initiative right here. Marvel Bucks, the system, the 99 cent comics. As, as comics, you know, the price of paper's going up, uh, they figured out a way to bring, you know, costs down and bring you comics for a dollar, which was just music, music to my ears at this time, because that was the cost of lunch money. And uh, the outlier here would be the Untold Tales of Spider-Man. It's retained its value. You go to dollar bins, you can find some copies. And I never, I never let those comics sit in those bins. Uh, I grabbed a couple of issues here and there as it was coming out. Never had it on the regular pull, but never was disappointed by one of those comics. Written by Kurt Busiek, art by uh, Pat Olive, and... Uh, Really, really solid comic. He's a, he's such a scholar in Silver Age Marvel, right? And, and he created these comics to kind of nestle in between Ditko issues and Ramita issues and stuff. Just yeah, like it was little, a s- smart gimmick. Little bridges. Professor uh, Xavier and the X Men that had uh, Jan uh, Derzima artwork, but and I like her work. Uh, she is a QB, you know, yeah. like like went through with like I think the Tim Truman. Tom Mandrake school. I think she's connected with Mandrake. I see some similarities with Mandrake art. But her style at this period on that comic, I don't know if it was instruction. I don't know if it was editorial where she's using like a Jim Lee style and it is not congruent with her natural sensibility. Don't, yeah. li- don't like it. Didn't never seen it, the other ones. Never seen say, Avengers. Never seen Fantastic Four. Unplugged. I don't remember those those issues. This Daredevil looks kind of cool in in like that McFarlane kind of sense. You know what I'm saying? Like like I would I I, I want to see what more of that. Like what what that is. Yeah, but this can also be a bait and switch. Like hard to tell if any of this art's actually from those books or the artists that are on those books. Yeah, it's true. Because even that thing is kind of interesting looking. Very strange. Yeah. All right, man. We're gonna take uh, Swan Songs for a couple of big. A big heavy hitter's been in a comics medium. Calvin and Hobbes uh, take their last wagon trip. I think it might even be in this in this Marvel book right here as a bookmark from uh, from, from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, where I have the clip out of of that final strip or an article about that strip taking the powder. Man, been around about a decade, and uh, Bill Watterson frustrated with the constraints of the medium as the uh, Sunday funnies are getting squashed more and more. He had pull, you know, he had the biggest, his uh, Sunday feature for Calvin and Hobbes was bigger than Prince Valiant, but it still wasn't enough. They still were squashing him and trying to get him to conform into like that six panel setup that most uh, Sundays were, you know, relegated to. He's done. You know, he wants to work on more, Stuff that where he has to have fewer artistic compromises. I think he's got a book coming out reasonably soon, if it's not out already. But I think he mostly does writing on that. It's it, to me, it's a non-story. It's yeah, I think it, it's unrelated to comics it, anyway. Yeah, it's like a picture book. Um, Sandman shuts his eyes. We're getting finally to a Sandman issue number seventy-five. Yeah, you're right. Talk about like two big endings. Yeah. Wow. Either either both of those worthy of their own articles and features. Big big news items. Totally. And Gaiman, it's interesting. He, you know, he spent he spent years, five six years with this with this character. It's, it, it, and even to this day, he talks about how this comic was his life during this period. It's going to end it a couple of issues prior and realize that like he, he couldn't let it go, taking it to that nice nickel and dime kind of ending man, with issue seventy five. No, no, no. <laughs> I love this art. I don't know who that artist is and why that isn't what the uh, Iron Man comics looked like, but boy, that's a cool image. Yeah, yeah you, it makes me wonder, like, how, how do you get that speckled texture? Yeah, I don't know. And it's, uh, you know, it's criminal that you don't got the artist names uh, in these captions and things, but uh, the article's a whole bunch of nothing. 
because it ain't going to matter because Wilson's going to be doing that. I think Matthew Brady is the guy who starts Newsarama. Oh, that's cool. I think that's him. Casting call so stupid. <laughs> Immortal Combat. Uh, this is the Garth Ennis, Steve Dillon article promoting Preacher comics. And uh, at this point, they're going to be putting out the trade paperback of the first seven. And they are on issue 12. I read this article. I saw the art. It's been promoted for, for you know, a year uh, at, at this point through Wizard Magazine. And I still, it made me remember, man, I still have my certain kind of rule set internally for comics buying, uh, even at this time. And the comics that were on the rack, it would say on the cover, you know, uh, whatever the name of the story is, part two of five, something like that. I ain't buying part two of nothing, man. So I'm going to wait until that is done, expecting it to get a trade paperback, just like that first batch. And my first issue is like 18, where it's that single story. It's the, it's how, uh, Jesse's dad got the wa get the got the uh, Zippo lighter from uh, John Wayne, and then this is the last monthly comic I had on my pull list ever. I wonder if you turned me on to this because I read Preacher and it was like five six volumes collected by the time I started, and I read through all the trade paperbacks, and then I started buying monthly for like the last you know we, dozen issues or so. We weren't connected. Uh, it 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 ends it ends when I'm at Kubert School. Okay. Like the last issue is out, and I have it on my pull list in Pittsburgh, and I'm like, I need to get fucking home. Like, don't talk to me. Don't tell me what's happening because yeah. like the because like homeboys had had pull lists <laughs> set up in Jersey at school. Don't even talk to me about that, man. Like, I gotta wait till I get it. Like when I go home for vacation or summer vacation or whatever the case. Yeah, I, I once I started reading this, it was like I need to read all of it right now. It might have caught me at the at the start of the article, man. A guy sticking a bayonet through his own throat, <laughs> villain sodomizing a petting zoo. Yeah, I want to see what that is. Yeah, it's uh, boy, what a unique series. Hard to imagine a series like this being published by a Marvel DC in today's climate. It's true. You know, like, like it just wouldn't. Ha You've got religious stuff. Every taboo I feel like Ennis could think of was put into this book. <laughs> And I think, like, the only thing that I recall being censored was something about, like, urinating down Margaret Thatcher's throat or something like that. Like, you know, <laughs> piss, pissing in Margaret Thatcher's mouth, something like that. It, it was a, an extraordinary reading experience for me. And it was also, like, one of those great creative teams. Yeah. You know, there's there, it's hard to find runs that are really inspired from this assembly line, deadline-driven monthly team and uh preacher man i put it up there with about any of them yeah yeah i do consider it a g great collaboration uh it's when um the the sort of great collaboration is the first run uh clem robin stays as letterer but it's the matt hollingsworth color that really ties things uh into this the the la the back half has color by i think pamela rambo and it's not the palette. It's not the same palette. It is a different palette, and it is diminished a little bit. It's a little bit more pastel, a little bit more poppy of a color. What we're looking at here is all Hollingsworth color. And the things that he would even do, like, he colored eyeballs in, in ways that, like, nobody in comics would do. They, like, this would, even in a night scene, it would still be white, you yeah. know? He just had such, and and continues to this day to have such a great palette. Um. But yeah, one of the great ones. And and part of part of the function of Dylan staying on track was there would be issues that were pretty conversational. You know, he'd be talking heads and, and Dylan would just have to draw it would almost be an Archie comic with the preacher characters. He was like such an unsung comic great to me. Yeah. Um because like the stuff wasn't flashy, but it was extraordinary. Like he was great at that stuff. The talking head scenes, like they all communicated. He was really good with expressions and all that stuff. And it wasn't flashy. Like he was able to maintain monthly for, you know, 70 issues or however long that series was. So very impressive all around to me. And you know, anybody unfamiliar with Preacher, I would say it's kind of a Western. It's really looking at like American pop culture through the eyes of an outsider who's able to kind of assess it that way. And it works in everything, you know, with with religion being a major kind of backbone of that type of American mythology. Risque business. Uh, this is an article about Penthouse Comics and how they got lots of hotshot talent to participate in that magazine. I feel like I, I, now, I've never seen an issue of Penthouse. Like you brought the one with the Batman Mobius story. 
You have a couple. I don't have too many. But this is all super strong stuff. They probably paid penthouse rates. They paid well. Yeah, that was always what I would hear. That Mark Texier art, really nice looking. All of this, man. I mean, we're looking at Adam Hughes right here. I'm not sure who this guy is. Maybe that's the Dan Barry stuff they keep talking about. Uh, the the X-Files stuff, like, if, if, if it gets into fucking and shit like yeah. that, man, like, that feels like like there might be an ethical issue. Like, like what if Gillian Anderson's your mom, you know, and, 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 and she, and she ain't never shown her titties in movies. And then you have such a great likeness. You're probably not into it. If she's your mom, you but know I what I'm saying? I bet a lot saying. of the X-Files fans were happy to have it. I know you're not autistic and you understand <laughs> what I'm saying. It's all satire, Ed. Yeah. That feels crazy to me. It comes up again and again in this article is like, um, traditional marvel dc pros justify working on penthouse comics right and satire is what they they come back to over and over yeah keith giffen yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of porno comics keith giffen does <laughs> and his gimmick is like listen I'm not just like focusing on cocks and and fucking every panel when we looked at the uh, mobius batman joint i remember telling you because like i guess at the time it was sort of newish to you and I remember like, oh, dude, you didn't get that Wizard magazine? And I guess you were fully out at that point. But like, I remember this spread right here. Yeah, I, I knew nothing about it until you mentioned it. And then it was just like luck that I happened to stumble across a copy shortly after that. <laughs> this here was like the saving grace. that I, This is the reason I'm here. That I've been telling you like, <laughs> oh, dude, we need to stick with Wizard, man. For, because we're, we're going to get the Todd Klein lettering uh, demonstration. Uh, it's here, so that might signify we don't got to look at too much more Wizard <laughs> after this. But look at the man, dude. Jimmy, when you and I were at Baltimore Comic Con, hatching the plot to create the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel, we're at a big dinner there, man, uh, for like uh, the Ringo Awards. Michael Ringo, rest in peace. Behind us, Todd Klein. You and I were a couple little girls whispering <laughs> to each other, man. Hey, that's Todd Klein behind us, man. Should I go in? Should I talk to him? I'm going to try to break the ice. Turned around, tapped him on the shoulder while he's eating his, his salmon or whatever. Hey, Todd, man, what do you got your aims, <laughs> aims lettering guide set on? And then he flipped around and was like, how you doing, boys? So yeah. We spoke his language for a minute there, dude. Boy, these, the, you know, there's a small list of the great letterers and certainly Todd Klein, you know, on that list, maybe the top of that list, but it is such a craft. Like these guys really are... From a from a from a generation that this doesn't exist anymore the no. way it once did. No. And the crossover would be with drafting and stuff when everything was like hand done. So you see things like Leroy Lettering Guide. This stuff was a drafting tool that was also used in comics because of that crossover of the letters and such craftsmen. I admire that kind of knowledge and, and practice so much. Totally. I have uh what what was the comic where Lobo first showed up? Omega Men. I have Omega Men comics written by Todd Klein, drawn by Kevin Nolan. Yes. We're going to have to look those at some of those. List. We're going to have to look at some of those things. But we're looking at the tools of the man. One of the things that struck me, and I wonder if, you know, this is a kayfabe photo or whatever, but like no tape on the Ames guide to keep him steady. <clears throat> yeah, that's interesting. I, I run a couple of Ames. Well, I have a couple of Ames guides. I really don't use them anymore like I used to, but yeah. I did letter for a long time with them and I had two and I would keep the tape on there. It's like, this is my standard size. This is the bigger size. Every, every letterer that I know would, would, would do that. So that, that suggests to me that it's kayfabe Ames. Possibly. Number one, got to get the right equipment. So as a kid reading this, man, I'm going down the list. He's using rapidographs. You hear that, Phil Felix, my lettering teacher from the Cooper School? Like, Phil was very much against, like, you got to use the dips, man. Interesting. And, and what Phil used, believe it or not, was the 102 to, to do his lettering. Dave Cooper also. Like, Dave Cooper would pro-letter for Dark Horse and stuff back in the early days before, like, he becomes the, the celebrated cartoonist and painter. Yeah. And uh, I asked him about it because I thought his lettering was always so sharp, and he said well, Hunt 102, and it really changed the game for me. I was looking at, uh, there was that um, Chris Ware documentary done by like public broadcasts in chicago and i'm looking at his setup he's got the roachring cartridge fill uh joint rapidograph like and he that's what he does his lettering with that's interesting makes me wonder i've never used one of those those things are so dope i don't know that they make them anymore i don't see them anymore mm. you know what i'm talking about like the brown joint yeah two place those word balloons 
Three, use the Ames Guide. Draw your guidelines. Set the lettering size. Uh, it's so great to live in a world now, dude, where, like, you know, I'm setting up my daily strip. And with the idea of, like, two stacked, you know, pages to be the equivalent of, like, a Carl Barks joint. So I'm taking Carl Barks' original, and then I'm blowing it up using the template that I created for myself. And I'm figuring out exactly, like, how big his lettering is. Because I'm like, well, I'm going to do my lettering at that exact same size. And to figure out, like, your aims guide, like, from, from that. These guys had to eyeball that stuff. Yeah, you see him using that two millimeter lead holder. Yeah. I have a couple of those loaded up, one with the blue and one with the uh with, with my like F or H B uh pencil. Yeah. But then I actually use those quite a bit. Um just out of convenience, you know. I have other pencils, but those are usually handy. Here's what separates the champs from the trumps. M mentally arrange the words and word balloons and captions as you go. This dude he doesn't pencil his lettering. Chris Ware will pencil his lettering. So many people pencil their lettering before I do. Before they put it in there, get those arrangements just right. This dude's going in straight pen. I will say this. I occasionally, like if I have a script that I'm lettering from, I'll go in and I'll draw pencil lines on my line breaks. Mm -hmm. And the script kind of like visually look at be like, okay, these are about the same, you know, same widths or whatever. If I want to have a nice pleasing collection of, of lines of text, you want it to be about the same size. And uh, it's interesting, you know, he talks about arranging them so that they're, they're round or they're oval yeah. arrangements of lettering. Which, that's where I wouldn't be able to eyeball. You yeah. know, I would end up with like, oh shit, it's indented too much on the left side, and then it's like even on the right and looks bad. But I used to do that, you know, like even if I'd plan it, sometimes it would work out that way, and then I would adjust it digitally once it's scanned and be like, okay, move that line over How a How beautiful, right? Eighth of an inch, yes. That, that, that we could do that digitally mm -hmm. now yes. and, and, and uh, reorient our stuff, pull it down a couple of millimeters and center it in our balloons. Like, like we get we get to fully cheat. Compared to like what these guys were doing, and Klein's a uh, he's a digital letterer now. Like when he goes to shows, I encourage everybody to go visit his table. He has these uh, prints that he sells that are just like calligraphic pornography. Mm -hmm. It's digitally done stuff, but he's showing you that he ain't just no, some keyboard clacker, dude. This is a guy that has well beyond his ten thousand hours practice in in studying letter forms and. And what are all those terms? Kerning and what's the other one? Letting. Letting and kerning. And uh, just create these beautiful calligraphic prints that anybody, anybody's crib or studio would uh, benefit from having those things hanging up. Gets into some of the um, these dip pens where you get a chisel tip yeah. or a ball tip. Those are like the B's and the C's, I think, in the speedball nib nibs. Um, and I have a, we have a lettering video on this channel where like I kind of demo some of those pens, but even talks about the old tip of filing yeah. your, your pen nib to get that chisel point to do the real calligraphy where like your horizontal strokes are heavier. Kevin Nolan has talked about that in interviews. That's another one of those where like it's just the detail that I love. <laughs> like when we connected, you and, you and I, I, I picked up your Street Angel book off the racks at, at Phantom of the Attic and I looked at it and I'm like, Oh, this dude, not only does he hand letter, because, like, at the time, everybody was using that same fucking shit font. And to this day, we receive so many comics from people, and they use still the same shit font with the with the um tails on their lettering bubbles, on their dialogue bubbles that are just straight, you know? And I'm like, not only does this dude letter his own comics, but he's using those ball tip fucking C-nibs to do your shit. It's impressed me, because these nibs with a flat surface... These were the lettering nibs of the great comic strips. Because, mm -hmm. like, the panels of the great comic strips are gigantic, you know, six inch squares. And in order for that lettering to even be readable when it gets reduced into strip form, you need big, bold lettering. And, and I fucking suck at this shit so bad. Like, this is what they were teaching us to use at the Kubert School. And the problem is. ink, like, like ink distribution. My, my lettering forms were not consistent. Some would be a little bit more smudgy. I never got the hang of when to dip again or like how to get so much ink off to like keep all the lettering forms consistent. I give anybody props who does this and you were doing it as a kid. Yeah, consistency is the king of that stuff. Like if you ever watch, I remember there was a letter 
uh, a sign painter documentary and it would show people in training where there's just like, cause there's like three or four strokes, right? You've got a horizontal and a vertical and then like a round and it would just be like sheets where they were just like all, ver- you know, a yeah. hundred vertical strokes, you know, a hundred just over and over. And that's what you see in his lettering. Like it's so tight. Yeah. These kinds of letter forms. That's it's a, beautiful, man. I, I really love this kind of stuff. Totally, like, I mean, this is important to us. That and and that was the uh, that uh, the High Eisman Kubert School lettering assignments. It was an exercise in that. Like it would be like take a, take this graph paper, and then do like it would be two letters at a time. Like an E would be kind of a box, and then I forget what the letter to go with that would be. But basically, you, like you fill up a, a graph paper full of that. He'll hold it from a distance. And he wants a flat gray. And any points that he sees, like a little blotch or something, little blobby things, like that's a half grade off. Yeah. Like like you like you start off with an A plus. Now you got an A because you got a blob. Now you got an A minus because there's two. So on and so forth. That's a strange thing to be teaching in the year 2000. Yeah. Because at that point, like every Marvel DC book is probably digitally lettered. I'll tell you this. I'm so thankful for it. I'm thankful for all of it, man, because I, I hand letter my stuff to to this day, and it's better looking than, than that fucking typist bullshit. Um, oh man, I'm sad we're all done. Yeah, you got some the, more. The, I think this is fun, like seeing him actually doing the uh, the borders and the word balloons, because that's another one that, like, when I was learning what each person in the team does, the letters would often do rule the panel borders, and they would do, of course, the balloon shapes. Yeah. So it's kind of cool to see him doing that using the template. I often will use French curves now or freehand. Uh, which he says is an option. But um, the other thing is putting the balloon placement down. He said that sometimes they, there would be a guide for that, but also like he was free to change that around. And that's one of those things that I think a lot of comics, and I don't know who to blame, but like when that's wrong, that can be a really bad thing for the reading experience totally. if these balloons are arranged poorly. Yeah. All right, is that it? We're going downhill from here, man. <laughs> uh, fight, oh, who, who would win in a fight between this or that? Uh, the, this, By the way, this is nothing. I think this is the same Iron Man. Yeah, it looks like that art. Whenever I liked his art, I think this is the same same artist. And again, I don't see a credit anywhere. Yeah. Keep it rocking because I didn't read this for nothing. The uh, Generation X movie, it did come out. I loved it. Ain't gonna lie. Hey, you know what that Marvel DC thing is? You don't have to go back to it. Yeah. But it, it's uh, everybody weighing in on who would win. Because I think there it's, is a fan vote component, which blows my mind. But then, like, you have pros seriously talking about why, like, this or that character would win. Yeah, but who are the it's pros? So it's, it's Mark Grunewald and Mike Carlin. Like, the exact pros I would expect to be engaged in that kind of a conversation. When Titans Tussled 2, another article we don't give a fuck about. This character versus that character. This is Wizard, a crossover shit. Wizard man. turns into this almost exclusively. Like, like they really. It was such a push pull for me because I this issue I just is built into my mindset. That fucking Todd Klein shit is manna from heaven. But then you got two articles that is kind of bullshit. That little Gant Glenn Favorite's pretty dope. This looks like those two pieces of art that I like. Yeah, but that wasn't Favorite. Fla- Fla- Favorite's a much better character, uh, like a figure artist than, than that shit. Dude, about 11, 12 pages devoted to that kind of stuff. This is what I think of as like Wizard going downhill for me. I mean, I think we're done. Character profile? Like, I don't give a fuck about that neither. Like, give me two pages of Sam Keith chatter and then we could talk. Greg Capullo's crash course, man. They're gonna they're gonna rebound a little bit. Continuing his idea of uh, powerful pages fast, and uh, still very sound sound advice, man. To make conceptually pretty pages that don't look boring. I think I said this last wizard coverage because he's also talking about page layouts and panel layouts. Yeah. Like, pull out Wally Woods 20, 22 panels that always work, because you're getting a lot of this stuff. Like, your two shots, your shadows, your reflections. I think those are all Wally Wood, uh, Larry Hama shortcut panels. Yeah. How about the way he does this brick? It's the most interesting-looking bricks yeah, very organic. I've ever seen, man. He's allowing himself to just be... You know, he's not bound by the pa- by taping down a piece of paper. I'm a big fan of those kinds of uh, organic stuff because it's so the lively. alternative is you see people ruling those out where it's like static, too, too, too flat. Yeah, static stuff, man. Uh, let's see. Down and out. Yeah, this is your down shot. Last month he gave us the uh, high, the bird's eye view shot. Yeah. 
On the level is interesting because he talks about putting people on that baseline of a panel. And we've seen that a lot. We point it out. We like it. Mobius does it. Yeah. You know, I feel like that's a pass. Once Mobius does it, we're okay. It's and uh, he's critical of that. Don't, don't put him on that baseline. It's a weird uh, kind of breaking of the illusion. <laughs> Jaime does it. Toth does it. I'm going to stick with those guys. Yeah. Dude, all of this stuff, though, really is the Wallywood panels. Sure border check that's pretty cool like i always like these kinds of things i mean that's eisnerian right Mm -hmm. there yeah open panels is uh bill griffiths mentioned in his talk drawing board bunch of good art here i wonder how they choose man because this madman looks pretty dope that madman's beautiful yeah i bet mike allred saw that and was just in love probably track that down i bet that's in that (laughs) that in uh, allred's collection yeah like like how is this not number one look at this for like airbrushing there, this is a really impressive one. Last issue, I feel like there was almost nothing in the art section, and this one feels like people are really going for it. Pointillism on, on that weird Vogue cover. Yeah. And then we get Tick versus Megaton Man is fun. From a Pittsburgher. Yes. Jewel Strudler, and that name is familiar to me. I don't know the person, but like I, I think... They might have taken some classes at the Pittsburgh say, uh, Center they might for the have Arts. A, maybe a Don Simpson instruction class. I do think it is, man. Uh, a little before this time, maybe around this time, we'll say, for the Sunday feature in the, in the magazine section of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, it was a whole piece on Don Simpson. I carried it for years. I, I, I moved it four or five times, like at different apartments and stuff. And he did the cover for it, and it was a big piece on him, you know? It was like how I discovered he was a Pittsburgh cat. And what I loved was one of the characters he drew prominently was his character, the Slick, who's kind of like his, like, Spider-Man kind of Urzetz dude. But the Slick has a gun in the shape of a fucking boner. And what he swings from, it's like, it's cum. It's like, <laughs> it, it like, all the onomatopoeia is what the consensus agreement to, like, you know, splooge, squirt. <laughs> Glorsh, like all the great come onomatopoeias, and that's the character that he draws super big in the magazine section. I thought that was very subversive and cool. Hilarious. Toys. Big Look. article on uh, Ghost in a Shell anime. Shout to Leia Hernandez, man, for, for her contributions to hipping us kids to manga when it was called Jap Animation. You know, when yeah. anime was called Jap Animation. And we we just got drips and drabs on the bootleg circuit at the Comic Cons and stuff like that. It was at this point in time the Suncoast video and anime section was slighter than these two and a half foot wide bookshelves that I have. They'd be relegated into the back. It would be giant sections of Doctor Who videos, Star Trek videos, and then after that you got an anime section. And it would um very expensive, you know, like these it would be half hour blasts of Angel Cop or something. And it's twenty dollars, man, for a fucking a half hour video. Pretty expensive stuff, man, because they just weren't printing so many of those up, you know, like your Disney flicks would be five dollars or ten dollars because they're printing up millions. They ain't printing up that many of these things. And what we have here is the impending ghost in the shell anime feature film that is on the level of like Akira in terms of its revolutionary components. 70% cell animation, a whopping 30% of computer built into it, making it a very staggering visual. Worth noting that Toy Story is coming out this year also. Mm -hmm. So that's a full computer animation uh, uh, movie. And before that, on regular TV, there was a Crash Dummies uh, a computer animated, like a pilot. If you remember, there were toys and stuff. They were really trying to push it. It never got beyond the pilot. Uh, but they would show that pilot several over over the years on Fox. Uh, so the idea of computer animation was like such a new yeah concept. This is a cool article too because like the movie's done, but they don't have U.S. distribution. Yeah, and uh, it played at some comics. I think it was a Comic Con is where it played, so people did get to see it, but you know, very, very limited at this point. So this is all sort of preview of like, hey, this movie's gonna be coming. Not sure exactly how. Uh, really interesting. Like this is such early days for that, you know, and for like bridging 
how do we bring this stuff over to an American audience? And, and how do we grow that audience? Yeah, and here's how early it is. You know, like the Ghost in the Shell comic is being disseminated in issue format. And uh, the trade paperback, they're hoping to get out before the movie comes out. So around this point, probably a year before, is when I really discover comic shops. And Ninja Scroll was my joint to get me into comic shops, literally. And then seeing Ninja Scroll made me an anime fan. And uh, I started to branch out into, 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 into those waters and stuff. Get your Akira, get your Fist of the North Stars and stuff. So I was like with bated breath waiting for this because what this was doing, what Masamuni Shiro's work was doing for me was getting me to buy a big eye anime thing. Cause I, cause I was dismissive of that, you know, the Ramna type stuff. And it was like, that's like a cartoon stuff, even dirty parrot. Like I didn't give Adam Warren a shot because of the big eye joint. That was like cutesy and girly and little kid shit to me at, yeah. th at this time. But he got me to like, break that trend within myself to like give something like that a shot even though this is not anything like a Ramna or anything like that it's much closer to an Akira great piece though man I was I've never read you're under arrest uh huh have you ever read any of that no <laughs> so it's a uh, like a buddy a buddy cop series <laughs> And what they are after are uh, people who are stealing confront panty thieves. That sounds Japanese. <laughs> totally, totally. Uh, this this Miku thing right here. Yes. I, I don't know anything about it, but you see that armor and shit on the ankle. I swear to God, Rob Liefeld will start to draw young blood dudes with these boots and shit. I feel like he saw it from this. If I showed you that and went Brandon Graham's next comic, <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Like some of these things, it's so interesting to see people who were like, they had to be reading manga and American manga and stuff and really incorporating that into their styles in some of these cases. But even like the coloring, the little tiny highlight. Totally. Pretty neat. R-A-G-G-M-O-P-P -P, rag mop is the uh, subject of this, this round of Palmer's picks. I forget who it was, but I, I, like maybe, maybe you could corroborate. Maybe you were on this panel, man. But I remember seeing the rag mop dude in Pittsburgh on a panel. Might have been with Pat Lewis. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. You weren't on the panel I don't with this think so. fella. It's it's always possible. This is not a series I know. <laughs> Rob, this dude Rob Walton at the time, like like uh, when he was on this panel, he was like, "Rag mop is the best kids comic like on the stage." Like he said it himself, and I was like wow, this dude's full of himself. And then now I'm like, yeah, that's what you say. Yeah. That's what you do, man. Like you sell your shit hard like that. And, uh, I'll pull it out of a dollar bin if I find it. I'm curious to see it. Totally. There's plenty in a dollar bin, uh, at, at, at Ides for sure. I don't know much about it myself. Uh, calling attention to tyrant, stray bullets, true swamp, book of ballads and sagas and Paul Gris Kane. Love Paul Gris Kane. Um, Recommended reading, Wolf and Bird. I'll be honest, I've never read an issue of that, and it was a long-running series. And then this Drawn and Quarterly anthology, and uh, I mention it because there's a strip that they call out Road to America by Beru. He's an uh, Argentinian, or Algerian uh, boxer is the character, and it's a boxing comic, and it's good. I have this, and it's I think it's multi-part. I think it's spread over a couple of issues, but if you're into like the boxing kind of uh, comics, there aren't that many, but I always love those when I see them. Anything in the ring, you know? Right. But it's beautiful. It's that European, you know, those guys all draw like, just knock your socks off. Nothing in the Hollywood shit. Nothing in the drunk drawer. Actually, no, in this drunk junk mm. drawer, this Sam and Max Surfing the Highway trade paperback is, is noteworthy. Uh, Sam and Max would show up all kinds of places. Uh, at the last Ides Hall, I got an issue of Critters that has like an eight-page Sam and Max story in there. Wow. It hit Epic Comics, Kamiko. It hit the same publisher, like what, a Fish Rap Comics or whatever. You know, the Fish Police pub self-published imprint. They, they put out uh, a Sam and Max. Um, it was a regular color feature in like some in-house Lucas Arts that makes sense. magazine. So this was the first trade paperback to uh, to collect all of Sam and Max uh, up to that point. Expensive comics nowadays. Expensive comics then. This trade paperback is very expensive and very noteworthy that like, and I, I missed out on this, but I have the trade paperback put out by Telltale Games that collects all the same material and maybe a little bit of extra, 
But very interesting that Purcell did not bind himself to a comics publisher for this stuff. He's always been kind of more forward thinking, more far out. Uh, great cartoonist. One one of the absolute best cartoon like one of the few cartoonists that can make me laugh. Uh, such a like any pages of comics that he brings is is a gift to the medium of comics. And if you could get your hand on some Sam and Max, man, you 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 you're, you're all the better for it. And if you can't, we did cover some of this stuff. We do have a video of some of this material. Yeah, Kamiko joint or something. And and uh, I don't know if you got the trade yourself, man, but like a good not. a good Sunday deep dive uh, for like a complete Sam and Max, I think would be like one of those real good vibe Calvin and Hobbes yeah. type. Uh, Reading experiences and conversations. I think he was a roommate, early roommate of uh, Mignola and Art Adams. I think. Yeah, yeah. Like I, it was, it was the. I think it's. Imagine the, the pages floating around that joint. I think it's the Mignola issue of Comic Book Artist magazine that John B. Cook put out, and he described the dynamic. And I might get, I might get it wrong. I might get it wrong. Uh, but it was like, it was like uh, Mignola is the guy that is always on the grind scraping by to get paid like like get enough work to like pay the rent art adams is the guy working his balls off on every single page doing very little work over the course of that whole year and they both were like i don't know how steve purcell is paying rent at all i don't, I don't know what he's doing to uh make this work but it's working what does he do now? Do you know? See him video Pixar. Game? Okay. Yeah, he works at Pixar. Right right, right alongside uh, Scott Morse. It's not, no longer Todd Toys. It's McFarlane Toys now. And there's no ceremony to describe the difference. Like on our last stuff that we were showing off, it was Todd Toys, Todd Toys, but now it's McFarlane Toys. Yeah, list the 96 upcoming line and Shadowhawk's part of that. That was a cool figure. Maybe my favorite version of Shadowhawk is the McFarlane toy. Uh, the Max figure. I forgot there was a Max figure. Me too. I, I don't think I've ever seen it. I feel like it's a giant square. You know how like a few of those box. toys would be heavy and yeah. stuff? I feel like that might be a max uh Yeah. That might be a max toy. This might be it, guys. Uh the top ten comics, uh same as it ever was. This Wolverine, that's that's a weird uh reason for it to pop up there. What do they have a reason behind it? Retro Wizard at its finest. See an old Marvel Comics top ten list. Behold Rob Liefeld in the heart I don't understand. I don't I don't get it at all. That's weird. I wonder if he did the uh, the Wolverine gallery art. No. But still, why would that be? No, he didn't. It's it's the John, it's John Byrne. Hmm. Strange. Comic Watch, uh, Generation X number one. I believe we have a video with Brian Lee O'Malley going through Gen X number one, Generation X number one. See it in our shoot interview section. Got the top picks, right? Like uh, anything uh, jump out. I mean, any of these image Alan Moore comics to me are, are pretty wild. Like, I, I, I need to read some of them because they I just I wasn't into any of this stuff at totally. the time, so I skipped over it. But it's pretty wild to me that the stuff that he's doing. Big bib bibliography. I, I, got, I got them all uh, loaded up on my <laughs> iPad. Yeah, that's probably the way to go. Sandman 75. Look at that Charles Vest piece. Uh, there are several issues, man. Like, very, very noteworthy issues of Sandman that Vest was the artistic chores on like that Midsummer's Night's Dream issue is the one that won like the Nebula and all kinds of awards that the creators of the awards said comic book people will never get this award ever again. Right. It's a Charles Vest stuff. And uh in those old those early issues, Sandman meets William Shakespeare yep. and they come to an agreement and and uh Shakespeare has to write, write two plays. Uh, and this is a long time ago, you know, like, like it would be maybe issue 13 or something when the first vest one comes up. So this issue 75 takes care of that dangling thread, which would suggest to me that old story that you hear from a lot of creatives where it's like, know what your ending is. Yeah. And then enjoy the journey to that place. Neil Gaiman has said that quite a bit. Um, Ennis says it, this issue about Preacher, like knowing what the ending is. And the, the other note is Todd Klein talks about all the different fonts 
or styles of lettering that he would do for characters in Sandman. And for the Shakespeare character, he would look at samples of Shakespeare handwriting to try to create the uh, the style for that lettering. Sandman is, is Todd Klein's tour de force. Yeah. Every character of The Endless has their own script. Uh, sh- the Shakespeare stuff absolutely has its thing. It's all fish. I think of it as fish hooks. It's all got like little serifs and yeah. doilies uh, sticking off the lettering. What else do we got here, man? Pit number 10. Yeah, burn in the middle of his Wonder Woman run. Stray Bullets 8. I'm still on board with Stray Bullets at this point. You know, the next the next sort of trend in comics, like when I'm still fucking with, uh, with Wizard, is when that Mark Alessi guy buys a bunch of creative people and makes them like live in his compound or whatever. That is the thing that I'm 100% out on. I never read a cross-gen book or anything, and I'm kind of curious to see that story. Even as a kid <laughs> reading these wizards, I'm like, wow, these people letting themselves be pimped out by some dude who's just buying them, storing them uh, you know, in his hometown. And my thoughts, even at this time as a little kid, was like, why don't you just give an advance to... Uh, Dan Klaus to and say, Dan, make the greatest comic you can make, and I will like give you the loot. But it was just a jerk off for a rich guy who wanted to create like a universe of characters that he created as a little kid, and he had the loot. It's total like what's that? The, the Medici family and Mac- Michelangelo, like like patron That's artist. That's funny. I was gonna say like, what's the what's the you know, precedent for this. And I was, you're, you're <laughs> Medici and Michelangelo much higher than I was. <laughs> right. You know what, what, cause I don't know of a comic situation that's quite like that. You know, like I think of the old studios, not quite the same. Think of the manga setup sometimes with room full of assistants, still not quite the same. Um, I wonder about like an animation company where everybody's more or less in house, like a Pixar, if that would be the closest you get to some kind of the, here's s- the deal s- set up like that. From, from, from what I remember, like reading about this guy in wizard, this dude had, he, he a fantasy world of like what comics is and he believed the hype of the marvel bullpen and was like sad that like that was the real thing so he's going to use his money it's the mid 90s comics are on the outs he's going to buy these writers man and freaking ship them to uh you know amazon prime them to his neighborhood <laughs> and and set them up and shit like that uh, same with some artists. I want to see the whole list. I want to see the roster of who went. <laughs> see if anybody left early. It's 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 full job stuff, Because like I man. say, man, it is such a blind spot for me. Like, I give props to, like, a Steve mm-hmm. McNiven, who... Oh, I com- didn't realize he was part of that. He comes up through that. I think dudes as come a, out as of there a, stronger. As a rookie. Like, yeah. like, so he... That's his, like, first stuff. But, like... What's your? I guess everybody has a price. Like, like, what's your price, man, to get bought by a dude? Because like mine, it, mine comes with like at least six zeros to uproot me, house and home, and family and kids at school and that type of shit, man. Yeah, it's interesting. You ain't like, buying like, me. Were they salaried? I wonder how that all works. I too. think so. I Weird. Think so. I'm, I'm curious to see all of it. Yeah, but even then, I'm like, wow, these guys are like hoes. Like, it's literally like hoes. It's like let's bring let's bring some hoes into the stable type shit. I mean, it's, it's pimp and hoe. It's a uh, it's that nine to five, you know. Like it's almost like comics is a regular job. Just for those types, for sure, man. Dave Taylor. I think we looked at something with Dave Taylor. Was it was it a? Uh, did he do Judge Dredd? Is he a British dude? I don't know if he's British or not. We've definitely. Um, I feel like his name's definitely been on some stuff. I'm trying to think, because I get some people confused too. Like yeah. some of these names are just a little bit the same as other names. Because I think there might be some Dave Taylor that Kevin Nolan finishes, but I could be wrong, and it could be something close to that name, but not quite. Who drew Robin? Who was that? Uh, Tom Lyle. Tom Lyle. Okay, yeah, not even close. I think we're. Okay. I think that's it, man. The ego column has just disappeared, and there was no fanfare unceremoniously. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that there's too much uh, Todd McFarlane coverage uh, that's going to happen much later either. Starting to get some toy price guide stuff in here. I think this is a new bit. And then that will spin off and then there will be Toy Fair Magazine eventually. This is a this is an important bit actually. The resource page for young Eddie P uh, sending submissions even as a teenager and stuff. Uh, I absolutely use this page to my my benefit completely 
ignorant of like just exactly what all of it was. So, so I would just send packages to everything, including, you know, Gladstone Hamilton, which is just putting out Donald Duck treasury books and stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a broad list because you have like cartoon books, you have Fireman Press. These are self-publishers. Like, I don't know that they're um, soliciting any kind of submissions. It, but, it is funny, though, like uh, Kitchen Sink Press is listed there. And it's it's interesting, like when we talked to Dennis Kitchen and we talked about Mark Schultz and like yeah. Mark Schultz had sent his submissions all around and everybody passes on him. Yeah. And like his early first published work looks pretty darn good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's funny. Uh, you know, there's a there's a definitely a lesson for aspiring creatives to learn from that. And it is don't be discouraged by the no response or the negative response because like great people get passed on the same time they're getting accepted by someone else. It's just, it's timing. It's all kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, this is, this needs to be treated as spam. And if, if you are, uh, trying to make it, trying to, trying to do something, uh, knock on as many doors right. as you can, because the function of that is also that you forget the doors that you knocked on that were sort of lesser known or something like that. So you're not sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for a response from Image Comics or Drawn and Quarterly or Fantagraphics. It's like you put the blast out to everybody and then you get back to work and then you'll get your drips and drabs of rejection. Once the first rejection comes in, then more rejections will start coming in. Then you might get the personalized rejection. And then that's like somebody who has taken a little bit of extra time to give you a personal response that's the juice in the engine to keep going. And then maybe the next step is like you get a personal correspondence where you might even get a phone call. And it's like, no, you're not there, but keep rocking. Blue Comet Press is listed in there. <laughs> they, they were that super black and white indie uh, publisher early, early in the uh, black and white explosion days. And yeah, I guess your, they're still kicking. Yeah, what's your boy's name? Oh, shit. I can't think of it now. Good letterer, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Storman. Craig yeah, Storman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Craig Storman. <laughs> Storm and Norman. That's right. Schwarzkopf. It's the 90s, baby. Wow. That's it. That is a wild list of, of publishers. That's it, this issue. Man, I hope they keep the resource thing going as like the 90s continue. Okay. Because we're going to have like seven companies okay, I listed. Got you. I got years. you. I got you because there is going to be the next major important article to me that I remember in my mind is talking about the web portals of these publishers mm -hmm. so it's like now you can find like submission guidelines on these websites and these websites were not clean.com websites necessarily and i remember literally i would go to the homestead library to like print up the submission guidelines on fucking dot matrix paper at like you know five cents a sheet or something like that and that like have a manila envelope full of that stuff and I swear to God, man, if you tested me, I could recite the Fantagraphics submission guideline paragraph mm -hmm. about describing like the genreless nature of their strips, of their of their series, and and how they dis but so they're genreless, but describing what eight ball is. What it's the first time I saw kitsch culture. Like I'm like kitsch. Like what is that word? I have to like look that up. And that was like to describe the eight ball series. Uh, do you still have a copy of that somewhere? Definitely not. I wonder if that's something we could find on like the Wayback Machine. Because yeah. it makes me really curious when you're describing kitsch culture as like some part of their submission. Yeah, yeah. It was. No, well, Are it was, they saying don't send that in? It was describing what April. Like it was like we prefer to work outside of the box of genre. These are the titles that we publish: Eight Ball, celebrating or examining kitsch culture. Blah 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 blah. Uh, Love and Rockets, and then describing sort of like little bits of Love and Rockets, Acme Novelty Library. But so the kitsch culture was just describing like what 8-Ball is and giving you an example of how it doesn't, it's not, it's not something you could easily define as like drama or, you know, stuff that you see at the yeah. movie store. That's funny. Yeah. That's it, man. Wow. I don't know, Ed. It, it, it's not a great issue. <laughs> Is I it? love the Todd Klein stuff, but man, and, and the preview for next issue looks really bad. Yeah, totally. Uh, it may, it might be time to just dust off some uh, TCJ issues, man, and get into some actual real conversation and, and use our time wisely, use our intellects wisely, use our knowledge of comics wisely, because Wizard might be done for us, man. Maybe, maybe, maybe we could uh, look ahead, pull out a feature... 
But uh, aside from just the state of things in terms of like where comics was, this magazine falls off real quick and becomes a pop culture magazine, becomes a, a sort of nerd Maxim before Maxim is created. And it's about movies, this stuff with uh, showing characters fighting and who would win in a fight. I couldn't have cared less at age 12 or 13. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that used to be a popular letter column topic, like in the back of the Hulks and stuff, whenever I'd read every single page of the comics. And yeah. it would always be like, who would win in this fight? And it was always Thor and the Thing were the two people everybody would throw against the Hulk. Um, and I'm fine with uh, 12-year-olds having that conversation. We mentioned... I, um, I got nothing for that. In issue 53, the last issue we covered, how much the subtext from everybody was like, cells are dropping. And I think that's what you're seeing. You know, like this is wizard cells are now dropping and you see the wizard staff kind of like, we got to pivot. Yeah. So now you've got cover uh, cover models articles and, and stuff coming up, and it is like Maxim. It's exactly <laughs> like that. Yeah, but but Wizard still, you know, it, at at this point, sell them probably more than every comic. Yeah. Just like Cartoonist Kayfabe, the channel is m more popular than any direct market Marvel DC comic that comes out in any month. We have a bigger audience than any comic. Uh, Wizard had a bigger platform. And they do spin off. You know, they have a successful business. They they Last issue, they had Inquest, which is like the card game magazine. Toy Fair is on the horizon. Uh, that's that's going to come within this next year of 96, probably. So they have three big publications. Yeah, the toy stuff is... Um, I have an out-of-whack timeline in my memory for that. Because in my mind, like the toys are up and running at this point, And really, they're just about to start. It's McFarlane who, yeah. who who creates that excitement. And and he's funny, man, because in all the early stuff, he talks about, I'm not going to make you chase for nothing, blah, blah, blah. Everything is this. Every, no bells and whistles. It gets stupid. <laughs> from from the start, and then he fully leans into it, man. Like, like, from the start, I remember in the first round of McFarlane toys, Overkill comes with, like, a, uh, like a, a parking meter. <laughs> and there's like a five and ten cent parking meter there's a five cent and there's like a ten cent Jeez. and of course one of them there's fewer of those than the others and that's the overkill that's worth the most he was full of king of kayfabe yeah king of kayfabe say one thing do the other do you have that for like the first issue of that toy magazine could be funny no i don't have any of that shit i never cared about it yeah i was so on board like at this point in time every dollar i come across is building a comic library, buying art supplies, and like that's it. Yeah. No video games, no toys, nothing but comics. Every decision I make in life from like age 13 forward is with the thought of growing up to become a cartoonist and keeping like a low overhead, knowing that the income is not that of like a heart surgeon or something like that. So, anyhow. Those conversations for another time, Jimmy. But uh, I think that we might uh, might be become a co comics journal pivoting so that we can have some actual uh, good content and conversation other than Mark Alessi buying job dudes from Marvel and DC and making them move house and home to his neighborhood. Yeah, wow. Good to go? Yeah. Okay, Faber's like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new vids are available. Hit the Patreon up and you get these videos before anybody else as a King K Faber. And uh, you also have the opportunity to watch us stream these videos live, completely taking the K Fabe effect out of the equation. But the vids are brought to you by the books that we make. So Jimmy, let the people know. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, my next book should be out in July from Image Comics. It collects all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, along with one long story that has not been printed anywhere. Uh, you can also pick up Hulk Grand Design and The Plain Janes, both available now in print. And you can join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg and see my next comics being serialized there as I make them. Hip Hop Family Tree, the Omnibus is coming out uh, in time for the holidays. Uh, 504 pages. Uh, collecting the big four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree that are out there today, but it's going to also have 140 pages of additional art and content that is not in those four big books, including a bunch of art that I drew exclusively for this Omnibus edition. Put in your orders and pre-orders now. You don't got a good shop in town? Go on Amazon right away. Starting up the next round of Red Room Comics sooner than later in May begins... 
Red Room Crypto Killers, issue number one, issue number two cover right there, coming to you on a regular monthly basis, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game, each story self-contained, uh, there are two Red Room trade paperbacks out there that you could uh, get your hands on to this, to this day, this is the third round, uh, there are three volumes of X-Men Grand Design, and WYSIWYG out there. Jimmy, tell the people what else we have going on. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. All great ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give them those marching orders and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.